Welcome back, 4061ers. This will be our final lecture in our series on threads in a nutshell. In terms of logistics, we are here at Monday, April 27th, uh, the last part of our thread discussion. Uh, today you will have done a lab that consists of identifying some functions that are both dangerous uh, and not dangerous to use in threaded programs. This revisits a topic of reentrancy uh, that we discussed earlier associated with uh, signals, and we'll get to some of that later today as well. On Wednesday, we'll have the first in a two-part series on sockets that will bring us to the end of the semester. Next Monday, a week from today, is our last lecture together. That'll also be the final lab of the semester, Lab 13, which will touch a little bit on that sockets topic. And Project 2 is also due on that day. A week later, uh, we'll have our final exam, and I'll try to post some review materials uh, during the sort of preparatory week there. We may even have, uh, I plan on having office hours during that period, uh, so you can visit me during that, uh, but maybe also a review video of one sort or another. Project two is ongoing, and so you'll want to be working on that and finishing up with it. Some of the threaded stuff that we're talking about now uh, will pertain to it, and also be having a look at that multiplexed I.O. Uh, video that doesn't have any work associated with it, uh, but it does enlighten you as to how to make use of the poll system call in uh, project two. So let us resume a discussion of threads. Uh, we left off last time with this odd even workers problem. And if you don't recall, the basic premise was that you have two types of threads that are going to be running. One that will uh, run this even work function and one that will run this odd work function. This is a toy problem and then to demonstrate and motivate a new coordination mechanism that we'll talk about shortly. Uh, but essentially the job of even workers is to increment a global variable when it's even and the job of odd workers is to increment uh, this global variable count uh, when it is odd. Uh, the general code setup to make this happen then involved a loop and locking this mutex called count mutex that's associated with the variable. Uh, and if you start up a couple each of the odd and even workers, uh, then what you'll find as you run it is that code that looks something like the following uh, will work out okay, but it has some drawbacks. Uh, so again, to quickly walk through the structure here, as an example, we'll take this even worker, uh, and uh, if it's going to increment this global variable some number of times, and we've set this as a constant of five, uh, then what you'll do is to keep track of how many times this individual thread has uh, incremented using a local variable, uh, this iteration count. And while iteration count is less than five, you go through the following. Uh, lock the mutex, check if it's even, and then increment, along with uh, incrementing the number of times that this particular thread has counted up. Then unlock and come back around. If in the event that you lock the mutex and find that the value is actually odd, this is for the even worker, uh, then don't do any changes and don't count this towards your progress, as in don't increment your iter and don't increment the global variable count. Uh, instead, unlock and loop back around and try again. And this works just fine and it doesn't take too long to run. Uh, you can demonstrate over here uh, in the shell. Let's see, I need to change back into the directory associated with this class that's here. Uh, GCC this uh, odd even, uh, it's a odds evens. Uh, and this is called busy for a reason that we'll see in just a second. I'll we'll call this uh, OEB for odds evens business. Uh, busy, sorry, uh, for LP thread because I need to link that in. And if you run it, uh, OEB, uh, you'll see that after a considerable amount of output over here, I actually get to a count of 20. Um, now, if you analyze this uh, for some you know, integrity uh, to sort of see what's going on here, uh, then what you'll see is the output of the program uh, indicates which of the three threads is attempting to run this right now. Uh, as in thread one, which is an odd worker, uh, is at its zeroth iteration. The count is zero, so it's not odd. And this is means that this thread that was scheduled to run, uh, thread one, uh, it can't do anything. So it's not odd, I'm gonna spin back around. And interestingly, the operating system, uh, after this uh, odd worker uh, locks and then unlocks, not making any changes to things, the OS actually grants this uh, program the right to unlock the mutex uh, uh, or lock it again and check. And so what you see here is there are a whole lot of sort of um, output lines uh, that pertain to uh, thread number one 
looking at this count variable and finding it's not odd, there's nothing really to do, but then be immediately giving it, uh, being given back the mutex to, to check again. And as we move ahead here, uh, this other odd worker is also experiencing this phenomenon where a whole lot of lines here, you can see my uh, ticking down 6,600, uh, 6,900. Uh, finally, uh, we get to a point where this thread one is not, um, uh, in charge and so instead thread two gets uh, to go uh, and it's even so we'll proceed and uh, actually change this thing to be odd instead. Uh, immediately though thread two is given the mutex back and finds well I just incremented it it's not even anymore and so I can't actually do anything to it uh, despite the fact that it's locking and unlocking the count variable is, is never changing on that front. So if you uh, just looked at this sort of count of lines here to, to indicate like how much is there, uh, there's 16,000 some lines uh, from this busy uh, version of it. Uh, and this is a sign that while it works and we actually get count to increment 20 times uh, and that each of the threads actually does uh, five times, there's quite a bit of wasted effort here uh, where uh, the threads will be going through this process of locking, finding there's nothing happening here and unlocking, only get the mutex back when it doesn't really make sense uh, for that thread to have uh, the mutex back because count hasn't changed. It can't change because uh, an even worker is looking at an odd value here or vice versa. So the conditions under which these threads want this mutex are a little bit different that really the odd workers only want to look at counts when it's indeed odd, and even workers only want to look at it when it's even. And there's no point if you look at it and find it hasn't been changed uh, to, uh, there's no point for a uh, even worker if it looks at this thing, locks it up and finds that the value isn't even uh, to unlock it only to get the mutex back again, that we want some notification that it's actually changed. So this motivates uh, this notion of condition variables, which are, uh, and I'll say this repeatedly, an inappropriately named coordination mechanism, because uh, uh, we're meant to reflect sort of a condition on a variable, but they're probably, as a coordination mechanism, more rightly called a notification queue, and we'll talk a second. Uh, primarily, what they are supposed to do is to alleviate this polling kind of loop, where you're constantly locking mutex, checking value, finding it's inappropriate to what you want to do with it, uh, and then releasing it only to get it back again. This uh, loop lock business uh, creates a lot of contention over those locks, uh, and these condition variables are meant to alleviate it, although they can't do so entirely. First, a few bit of, uh, bits of mechanics here. Uh, these condition variables or notification queues or uh, monitors, uh, whatever you want to, to call them, uh, they're primarily uh, used to uh, indicate when some condition has occurred in a program uh, that may be of interest to certain threads, but not potentially all of them. So down here then, uh, what you'll see is the basic set for these things looks very much like mutexes uh, in that you initialize one uh, and you can destroy them later on when you're finished with them. And you have these sort of weights and uh, I hesitate to say like post here because that was more semaphore, but um, a, a function that sort of uh, indicates you're interested in the uh, condition variable, sort of like wanting to lock it. And a couple of other functions that we'll talk about in a second, uh, which allow you to release uh, this condition variable uh, after sort of notifying folks that uh, something has changed about it. Uh, you'll notice here in the calling convention for this cond wait business, you have to pass in a condition variable, but you also pass in a mutex. Essentially what condition variables look like are uh, that you have some global resource, some shared resource that is uh, protected via a mutex. But then the condition variable adds a little bit of extra magic on top of that to indicate that uh, you can have separate condition variables for separate um, sort of uh, con states for the variable to be in. Uh, importantly, uh, what this will do is to say, uh, if I am attempting to change this thing and can't, then I can go to sleep and wait for the condition that it has changed uh, to arise. 
Now I could get notified on that front uh, via these two other functions that uh, if I make a change to some variable, uh, I can then indicate to anyone else who is interested in, uh, in it uh, that, yeah, I've made changes to this shared resource uh, that may be of interest to you. So at this point, the OS will take over and wake one of those other threads up. That's the pthread con signal or all of the threads up that might be interested in that. That's the broadcast part. So these two functions uh, serve to sort of indicate the notification queue associated with this uh, condition variable. Uh, this will notify one other thread that's uh, interested in changes uh, associated with that uh, variable. And this will notify all other uh, condition or, or all other threads that are awaiting on that. So a typical sort of uh, uh, setup that you'll see is that a thread interested in uh, this uh, global resource uh, will wait on this uh, pthread uh, con variable over here and it's the mutex associated with protecting that global uh, variable uh, and this will block that process until another thread that has made a change that uh, it coincides with the condition associated with that condition variable uh, will call this a signal or broadcast which will cause the uh, thread that's waiting uh, to wake up and check all these things. Now, this is made much more easy uh, if you can see some concrete code here. And so here is an adaptation of this odds evens problem using condition variables instead. You note know, up top here, uh, in addition to the mutex up here in line two, I have now a cond variable. Uh, and this uh, condition associated with the condition variable, uh, what I'm sort of intending semantically here is that this is the condition that the count has changed from something uh, that it was. You'll see down here then uh, the following new structures. Uh, first, there's a lock on this, and this always precedes uh, um, condition variables uh, as well, that you must lock a mutex uh, 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 that to access the global resource before you check it the first time. Once locked, uh, then you can uh, check to see that the condition you're interested in uh, count is uh, even in this case. If that's true, uh, then you can move ahead, do the increment, uh, and then unlock and notify anyone else who's waiting on a change to this count uh, that indeed uh, it has changed. On the other hand, if this even worker is looking at this count variable and finding, oh, it's actually odd, it's got a value of one, for instance, then the call to pthread con wait will do two things. First, it will block this thread. And it will put it to sleep, awaiting on notification from some other thread that's going to make a change to the count variable uh, and wake it up. Uh, you'll see here now that in addition to the uh, condition variable that's passed in, there's this mutex that's passed in as uh, an argument to this as well. What the OS guarantees is that on calling con wait, this thread will release the mutex that it owns right now and block. And when this function returns, the thread that it returns to uh, will actually have this mutex locked once again. Um, so this creates an invariant that in this region of code here, I'll always have this count mutex locked because returns from pre-thread con wait, uh, whoever gets woken up to say, hey, you wanted to know about when count is changing uh, based on this condition variable, I'm gonna give you this mutex associated with that as well. Uh, so to that end, uh, these two things sort of work in coordination together. Uh, now the reason for the while loop here uh, may not be uh, apparent at first, uh, but if you read closely the documentation associated with pthread con wait, uh, it'll mention the fact that this uh, it, it, threads can be woken up sort of spuriously, that uh, the condition that you want to be true uh, isn't actually true when you wake up. So every time you return from this con wait, you have the mutex in hand, you should check, is this uh, in a state that I am interested in right now or not? Uh, because it could be that uh, through some broadcast, one of the even threads wakes up, uh, finds that uh, this is even, and increments it, but then the other thread uh, that is associated with uh, the sort of even workers wakes up as well and finds that this has actually been incremented to be an odd value now, so should go back and wait for another change to this to happen. Now, uh, if you want a full account of this, uh, this is in the code associated with the code pack here, uh, this odds evens cond bar. And aside from the additional output that that's mentioned over here uh, to sort of give indications, uh, largely what you see uh, in the slide example is uh, there, that this pthread con wait uh, that's present here at line 19, uh, this is the primary change that we'll see along with the introduction of the condition variable. 
we compile and run this thing. So it's a GCC, I'll call this uh, odds evens cond variable. Uh, and that's odds evens cond var. See, I'll link the pthreads library. Uh, and if I run this uh, odds evens cond variable, uh, you can see already that this is considerably less in terms of locking and unlocking. Uh, that whereas before I had some 16,000 lines of output associated mainly with a thread locking something, seeing that it's not odd or even, whichever it wants, and then unlocking only to relock immediately afterwards. Here, there is only a screen full of output lines. And this is primarily because we are going to avoid one of these kinds of loops where uh, thread one who wants things to be odd, uh, will wake up, see that the value is even, uh, lock uh, and then unlock, only get the lock back again. Instead, threads will, upon seeing here that the variable for the even worker, for instance, isn't uh, even, uh, will go to sleep and say, only wake me up when this thing is actually changed which causes this thread to be blocked like for a considerable more duration and gives a chance to the other threads that are out there, uh, for instance, the odd workers to actually take their turn, acquire the mutex, uh, and then uh, move ahead uh, to change that variable, thereby notifying afterwards through this broadcast uh, that everyone else is uh, uh, potentially but available. Or sorry, that that changes the the, the uh, uh, variable could sort of indicate that others uh, uh, can make progress. Um, so you'll see up here, this isn't foolproof, uh, that uh, the zeroth thread here uh, will get access first to count and it'll become even, uh, but then they um, uh, will find that it is the first thing that's sort of notified of this uh, and uh, that's not even now, but then we'll go to sleep permanently, whereas this would have created a long tight loop with lots of not evens in our preceding example. The condition variable at this point uh, will cause this thread and the even uh, sort of worker over here to go to sleep and be blocked by the operating system until some other change has happened uh, to the condition variable. Uh, you can see over here then uh, that the next thing to get access to it is one of the odd workers. Uh, it is odd and so it goes forwards. Uh, the other odd worker doesn't get access to it. Uh, and so there'll be a few spurious sort of wake ups in here, but largely this is a much more efficient uh, than our preceding one. Uh, you can see that in terms of timing too. Uh, so if I time this, uh, it takes barely any time versus uh, the uh, odds even busy version. Uh, let's see, this takes uh, in terms of time like a, a, a fifth of a second or so uh, versus the unbusy version takes uh, only a fraction of that. So this is looking good and that I only sort of wake up threads when something of interest has actually changed about the global states rather than constantly locking and unlocking only to find that I'm the only one working on a thing and I can't change it in some appreciable way. But this loop should bother you just a little bit uh, in that we're still gonna have instances in which uh, we have this iteration of lock, check the count, and then try again. Uh, this is better because you go to sleep sort of on a more permanent basis uh, if uh, it doesn't look the way you want it. Uh, but you might want to consider if there's even a better way to do this. Uh, and the sort of ultimate iteration of this is to actually establish two different conditions associated with this count variable. It's either eed or uh, it's, it's either odd or it's even. Uh, and to have two separate variables that are essentially notification cues for those interested in this thing is now even or uh, this thing is now odd associated with this odd con variable. This is the next step in refining this. In that case, we'd uh, have slightly different code associated with these two, uh, wherein the even worker would be waiting on the even condition uh, associated with the even condition variable, and the odd worker uh, would be working, waiting on this thing being odd instead. Once an even worker finds, ah, this is indeed even, and so I will go ahead and increment it, it will notify someone who's waiting on the odd condition uh, that this is the case. Uh, and vice versa, the odd workers, once they find that it's even, wake up and increment it, uh, or sorry, once they, they wake up, find it's odd, uh, will notify then after incrementing that the value is now even. And so the side-by-side -side code that's listed over here uh, has a little marker in between where there are changes associated with uh, one side, left-hand side code uh, and right-hand side code. Uh, that here, the 
even worker is going to be waiting on, on the sort of condition variable associated with um, evenness uh, until this actually is even. And while it's not, we'll continue to sort of wait in, in that loop. Uh, once they actually increment it, uh, it becomes odd. And so we'll notify down here anybody who is uh, interested in this count variable being odd at that point. And vice versa, uh, we have the opposite over on the right-hand side. The odd workers are going to wait while this thing is even. Uh, they'll fall into this part uh, and say, uh, notify me when this condition variable is true, that the count variable is actually odd. Uh, and down here, once they've incremented it, we'll notify everyone, hey, now it's even. Um, so we can do one final comparison down here then. Uh, let's see, just for uh, sort of the sake of uh, comparison, let me... Uh, do a word count on this thing. Uh, it's a word count. So this is our odds even apart, this 44 uh, lines of output, uh, which is an indication that it's fairly short and there's not a lot of sort of spinning on this part. I've noticed in my experiments that this uh, final version here, which is called uh, two con variables, uh, where we divide work up between uh, up top here an even and an odd con variable uh, where folks get separate notification on that. If I compile and run that thing, uh, here's uh, out uh, odds, e odds, evens, two uh, con variables, uh, and this is odds, evens, two con variables dot C. Oops, sorry, I got a link uh, p threads uh, and o e two C and give a word count. Uh, this usually doesn't have that many fewer lines of output because the market improvement is not spin, spinning, uh, sort of locking and unlocking in mutex that isn't changing. Uh, but you can see in some cases, at least uh, we get slightly better performance. Time-wise, this is minuscule, so I don't expect that we'll get uh, much better. Uh, now, if the amount of work that was being done was more than incrementing a global variable, uh, as was sort of indicated down here, uh, associated with this uh, update uh, function, uh, don't concern yourself too much about that, the fact that that update is there, uh, but this is a, a glorified variable increment. Um, if there was more work being done here, then it might make more sense uh, to that end um, to uh, make use of two separate condition variables here. Uh, but the main thing I, I sort of want to uh, get folks sort of interested in this particular coordination mechanism is that then we have a single shared resource, but the conditions under which these two operators would want to make use of it are different. And there's still one sort of protection mechanism, this mutex, but now two different spots that you can notify others about uh, the state in which this thing resides and is therefore, um, uh, you're sort of able to separate out concerns on, on that front. Uh, we still got quite a bit of efficiency uh, over changing this to use a single condition variable, uh, but in more complex MRLs having several different conditions associated with the shared state, uh, this is extremely useful. One of the classic problems that demonstrates this uh, is the so-called bounded buffer or producer-consumer problem. In this, you have a bunch of threads that are creating data and a bunch of threads that are consuming data. And the shared resource is the buffer in which these items that are being created by producers and consumed by consumers, uh, the buffer in which those things exist before, like, after they've been produced and before they have been consumed. Uh, this is typical for like job queuing. Uh, and if you have a bunch of users all wanting something to be done and a bunch of threads that are all sort of executing them, uh, then these users are plopping down things to do in here. Uh, we've seen examples of that. And these consumers are threads that are picking things up to do in here uh, and advancing forwards. Uh, so the fact that this is bounded, as in there's a fixed number of slots, in this case you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so slots uh, on the screen. Uh, if producers run out of space to plop things down in, they tend to block. This is I'm trying to add something in here, uh, then I should stop if it's full. Uh, and wait for a consumer to actually fish some item out so that there's actually space available again. Similarly, if this thing is empty because the producers are taking too long to produce stuff, uh, then any of the consumers that are trying to pick up an item from here uh, should block as well. And the only reason for a consumer to come back online is if in fact there is something actually in here to pick up that wouldn't do for it to lock the array, look and find it's empty still and then unlock it only to lock it again and find, ah yeah, it's uh, 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 still empty. 
And similarly, the only reason for a producer to wake up if it's stalled is that if there's actually a spot for it to place an item in here. And so to avoid these kinds of uh, spinning situations that you have over here that we saw associated with the odds evens part where producer A locks and sees, oh, there's no space in there. Producer B locks it and sees there's no space in here because none of the consumers have run yet. Uh, a condition variable is typically introduced to indicate there's actually been changes to this. And importantly, you can have a couple uh, condition variables, one associated with the uh, uh, availability of space in here for producers to put something down, and another associated with the availability of items over here that would, if consumers were blocked, uh, notify them that they could actually pick something up over here. And so a typical solution would have a couple different condition variables uh, to indicate space available and items available uh, in here that were used to coordinate the activities of the producers and the consumers. Every time the consumers would consume something, they'd notify producers, hey, uh, in case you're wondering, I've picked up something item uh, off of here so you can have another slot that you can add, add something in. Uh, and every time the producers would plop something down, they would uh, indicate to the condition variable associated with items available uh, that would wake up any sleeping consumers uh, to grab stuff out of there. Still, there will be a single mutex that is protecting this uh, data structure, probably the array and the number of things in it, along with maybe where the sort of uh, head of the queue and the tail of the queue are at for producers and consumers, respectively. It's still just a single shared resource. It's just that the conditions under which these different actors would want to access it uh, are slightly different, uh, giving you these two different condition variables uh, that would uh, sort of align with those interests. So that'll end our discussion on uh, the condition variables. And I wanna recall a few things that we talked about earlier because as we round out our discussion of threads, uh, they'll be somewhat important uh, and take up a, a more prominent place. Uh, this is the notion of re-entrant functions, which was the subject of a recent lab. And so take a moment, if you didn't already, recall what it means for a function to be re-entrant and maybe what context we discussed that in before. Uh, what is it that is sort of associated with re-entrant functions versus those that are not re-entrant? Uh, and anticipate how could this play out in terms of our current discussion on threads? So take a moment, uh, recall those things, uh, and get back to me. All right, that should be long enough for you guys to pause and mull this over if you're so inclined. The root word of re-entrant should be fairly obvious. It's re-enter. And the notion of a function that does this is one that can be stopped midstream and then re-entered by some other executing entity uh, without causing harm to the functionality or corrupting any data associated with the function. Uh, we discussed this in the context of single, uh, signal handlers earlier on. Uh, now, so this is the first uh, sort of uh, the first uh, point in the class that we had some notion of sharing and two separate entities that could simultaneously be executing within the process image of the code. Uh, importantly, then, we discuss this reentrant function uh, as one that usually has some protection mechanisms or lacks any appreciable global state that needs to be shared with separately running instances of the function. However, any function that has a global variable that it's modifying is subject to get messed up uh, by reentering it to midstream. Uh, that bears then some further discussion in the context of threads because global functions or functions that have global variables are obviously then sharing some state and if they can those functions can be executed simultaneously by threads there's a real danger of that data being corrupted in some way um, so there are a variety of useful functions that are not re-entrant and in the context of uh, signals we discussed it's very, very bad news uh, to call functions like malloc and free. Uh, instead, you'd want to, in the midst of your code, call those functions, but never in a single signal handler, because if your main code was executing malloc, was interrupted by a signal, then it would be very unsafe for the signal handler to enter malloc, potentially corrupting the state associated with it. 
Now, this is interesting because there's actually a distinction between the no, notion of something being reentrant and therefore asynchronous uh, safe uh, for signals uh, and being thread safe. And if you look at the documentation associated with various functions, uh, then you will see this MT safe or MUTI. Actually, it should be multi thread safe. I'll try to make that uh, a correction soon. This is actually a POSIX sort of standard that uh, certain functions are supposed to be callable by several threads at once without messing them up. Now, this is distinct from uh, signal safe. Uh, and an immediate sort of question is, well, how do, what does this have to do with the sort of re-entrancy? Uh, if a function is re-entrant, does that make it thread safe? If a function is thread safe, does that make it re-entrant? Uh, and the important distinction you'll find as you look around is uh, the one is sort of a superset of the other, that if a function is re-entrant, has no real appreciable shared state between stuff, then it's more or less automatically thread safe and more or less automatically signal safe as well. On the other hand, just because it is thread safe does not make it re-entrant and does not make it safe uh, to call within uh, uh, a signal handler. And a primary example of this is something like malloc, which uh, we'll find as we look up in the manual is MT safe, but is not signal safe. Uh, let's examine quickly. Uh, so here's the manual entry for malloc. Uh, and hopefully on the left-hand side over here, uh, you can see up at the top a discussion of Malix and so forth. Uh, and one of the attributes associated with it is thread safety or MT safe. Uh, and that's good because it means multiple threads that you are potentially getting to gang up and cooperate on a computation. They don't need to worry about clobbering the heap associated with uh, the program by simultaneously calling malloc or free uh, or one calling the other and modifying these so-called data structures or global data structures that are shared by the entire uh, process. Uh, instead, this is guaranteed in interesting ways. Uh, there are a couple different approaches, but the most obvious one that you could envision is just have uh, some sort of a mutex associated with the heap that as one thread wants to malloc memory, it will lock that mutex. If another thread comes along and wants to free uh, something from the heap, it also has to lock the mutex because it's changing this global data structure associated with heap memory. Uh, the thread that's later trying to free uh, blocks until the first thread finishes its malloc and restores the state of those global data tracking heap memory uh, to a safe state that allows free to then enter it. Uh, that will then wake up the thread that is trying to free stuff or malloc stuff uh, and can go in and manipulate uh, the uh, heap data that's associated with those uh, sort of tracking of uh, pointers. Uh, it can manipulate that stuff safely because it now owns the mutex that protects the critical region associated with it. You can imagine if there's a lot of mallocking and freeing going along, uh, going on in a lot of different threads, then there will be contention for those locks. Uh, just as what we saw earlier, there's contention that can sort of lead to degradation performance, uh, then that would be the case here by making malloc th uh, thread safe through mutexes, we may hurt the performance of that. This is counterproductive, so actually a lot of modern implementations of malloc that support thread safety like this, including the one that is in the GNU C library that's linked by default using uh, GCC, they take this alternate approach where every thread has its own sort of private heap, uh, and to that end, it does not share any global variable uh, with or global data associated with other threads to manage the heap. Uh, these pools then of memory that are associated, or arenas as they're sometimes called, uh, they make it completely sort of parallelizable amongst several threads to malloc stuff. Uh, so to that end, there are different approaches uh, to this, but suffice to say that this is still not a function that is safe to call in a signal handler. Uh, to understand why, envision the following scenario. Suppose that we actually did make use of a mutex or malloc simplest sort of easiest way uh, to do it. Uh, and I come along and are attempting uh, to test whether or not this is async signal safe, as in if it's re-entrant, uh, and I could safely call malloc both from my main code and from a signal handler. Well, the mutex protects several concurrent threads that are all running uh, from accessing global data and messing things up. Uh, they block each other and sort of uh, when one finishes its operations, the heap will let another run through its critical region. 
That isn't so for signal handlers, which have the following potentially dangerous situation. You're running a thread and it locks this mutex X associated with malloc in the heap. Then the program receives a signal. And depending on the semantics associated with signals, this will probably block this thread that holds the mutex associated with heap, uh, this mutex X. The signal handler wants to run this function as well, despite the fact that it's marked as this is not safe for signal handlers to run. It tries to malloc something, which leads to the malloc code attempting to once again lock this mutex X. This is bad because at this point, the signal handler has locked, attempted to lock that mutex and will block because it's already owned by a thread. But this thread isn't going to resume operations until the signal handler finishes. And thereby, we have established a very firm deadlock, and this program is just going to sit there uh, without making any progress at this point. So uh, to that end, uh, this is one way that you can make certain things thread safe, but not necessarily make them signal safe. And the list of functions that is thread safe is much bigger uh, than the list of functions that is safe for asynchronous execution uh, in signal handlers. So generally be very, very careful around signal handlers uh, and be careful around threads that you check. The functions that you're running there uh, are actually safe to be executed in multiple threads at once. We've seen that in order to reduce some overhead associated with this locking and unlocking business, you can actually um, look for variants of functions one of the most common uh, that we talked about early on is the rand function uh, which generates random numbers uh, and typically makes use of a global variable for this Whoop, the wrong rand here i need to look in the manual page three or section three for the uh, library rand function it's over here uh, associated with this thing then is a uh, both rand and a re-entrant rand underscore r version. Uh, the difference being the rand makes use of an implicit global variable that tracks the random number generator states, uh, and rand r, you feed it uh, this state uh, repeatedly, as it's called. Uh, this enables then uh, the random number generator uh, to have its own private space uh, that would be private to every thread that's running there. Uh, and so as you're running in sort of a threaded uh, situation, you want to look for uh, versions of functions that can be uh, safely run or are protected. If you look carefully on most Linux implementations, RAND itself, despite having a global variable, uh, is marked as MT safe. And this is very likely uh, through the use of a mutex, which will uh, prevent multiple threads from corrupting the global state that's buried in this global variable associated with RAND. Uh, it'll still be more performant to make use of a lock-free solution in this RAND R version. Uh, but as you go to other Unix systems, uh, they might not actually have this MT safety associated with the RAND function, uh, and you'd want to make use of of alternatives instead. So this starts to get uh, at the interaction of threads uh, with other entities that we've discussed in terms of operating system land uh, and to expound upon that a little bit uh, to get away from the signals part and deal more with processes. Uh, it's generally a bad idea to mix both processes and threads. Uh, there is a statement in Stevens and Rago uh, that um, this is to be avoided because uh, signals themselves are hard enough to deal with uh, and introducing threads into it to uh, make things uh, difficult. We have one example of that right away with this sort of potential to be making use of uh, thread safe functions, but if you call those in signal handlers, uh, things can go awry somewhat. Uh, this uh, linked stack overflow post is also uh, interesting as well, uh, that having multiple processes and on top of that, each process with its own thread uh, is a recipe for pain generally. Uh, some of the pitfalls involved that if you were going to um, engage in this dangerous kind of activity uh, that you'd want to be available or uh, sort of be aware of as you go forwards is that uh, threads themselves can have their own signal masks as in this thread is temporarily blocking signals and won't receive any that are sent to it uh, versus this other signal that's or this other thread that is part of the same process actually has a different uh, signal mask that it's not blocking signals at that point. Uh, the semantics of actually how that uh, plays out if you sent a signal to the process which thread would sort of be uh, interrupted uh, for it is uh, a little bit mysterious to me. Uh, I haven't experimented with greatly because generally I try and avoid pain when possible and this seems like very much a recipe for it. 
Uh, you'd also want to be aware that calling fork uh, may or may not carry with it any threads that were created already. Uh, one of the references I've seen uh, is that as you would call fork, the new process, the child process that's generated, uh, it has all of the locks and mutexes like present in its memory image uh, that the parent process does, but it only has one thread. Uh, and this seems a little counter too to me that uh, uh, the way I would tend to want to implement it is if a thread has, uh, or a process has four threads and some process in that forks off a new child process, I'd want four processes in it. But that very well may not be the way most mu uh, Unix uh, implementations actually implement this. So you'd want to study carefully if a single thread is forking off a child, how many threads does that uh, child process actually get? It makes sense to some extent based on my understanding of the low-level Unix uh, or low-level Linux implementation of this that we talk about in a minute, uh, where essentially there isn't a big difference between threads and processes, why a thread spawning a process would create only one single new thread. But I digress on that part. Like you'd want to study that if you're going to intermingle these. Uh, finally, then, uh, if you were going to coordinate multiple threads and processes, then you probably want to look at some individual functions uh, that facilitate coordinating on I.O. Uh, for instance, pread and pwrite. Uh, these are functions that allow you to write to a certain offset in a file and tend to be handy so that threads don't clobber uh, parts of the file uh, that other threads are banging on at, at one point. Uh, potentially useful in some contexts, including some of the advanced portions of the project. Uh, so look up those functions if you're terribly interested in having multiple uh, threads combine and work on a single um, a single file. So then, um, to, in terms of avoiding intermingling processes and threads, uh, it's right to point out that you probably want to pick one or the other uh, for your application. And this gives rise to a discussion of, well, which should I pick? But I think it's more important to understand how these two are similar, threads and processes uh, versus different. And the Unix standard, I think, lays out some fairly strong language about this, uh, that threads versus processes, a lot of the sort of uh, behavior and uh, semantics of their differences boil down to how they behave for different uh, system calls and how they behave ter in terms of sharing. Something we have emphasized uh, again and again uh, that threads by default, they share a lot of stuff, uh, just about everything in fact, versus processes are largely distinct from each other and may by default share a few kernel structures, but generally don't share any memory. Now, due to the uh, similarities in terms of how the OS would actually treat them, a somewhat common approach to this that uh, Linux uses is actually to treat them more or less as identical entities that are parameterized in different ways. Uh, and this is a so-called one-to-one -one model uh, in which every thread actually is considered a runnable entity by the kernel. Uh, and so too, every process is considered uh, as a runnable entity. Uh, within a process, there's always at least one runnable entity. You can think of that as a thread if you like. Uh, but uh, from the perspective of the scheduler, all these things are just something I can give CPU time uh, and that will work on some block of memory that's been condoned by the virtual memory system. To that end, Linux implements both the fork system call and the pthread uh, system call to create a thread using the same underlying mechanism known as clone. This is Linux specific, so if you go to other Unices, uh, your BSD flavors, uh, including Mac OS X, don't expect to find clone. Uh, if you look at its uh, fine grain details, uh, you'll find that a lot of the parameters just dictate for the new runnable entity that is created by clone, how much is shared, as in, should I copy a bunch of the data or should I sort of inherit the data uh, with direct pointers so that the new entity, as it makes changes, those will be seen by the old entity. You can envision then fork is a simply a call to clone that says, make copies of everything. Uh, and so as a new process is created via fork, clone is invoked and duplicates of the heap and the stack and the uh, sort of global variables and so forth, they are created for the new runnable entity that fork is making. We think of this as a process, and this is why then a change to a global variable in the fork process isn't seen by the parent process. 
versus pthread create is just a call to clone that says share everything with the other runnable entity uh, that is creating you. Uh, and to that end, this is why when you create a new thread and it makes a change to a global variable, uh, all the other threads will see that. Uh, so to that end, this one-to-one -one model is actually the most common one that you'd see out there in OS land, at least for the low-level implementations of threads and processes these days. That Linux and BSD and very likely Windows, they use this model for a thread being this schedulable entity that the OS kernel is going to put on the queue of things that can run, that can block uh, because of I.O. or want from mutex, independent of other runnable entities that might be under the same umbrella. Uh, but to, uh, to that ends, like this difference between processes and threads, it isn't actually so great when you get down to it. Now, there is another kind of thread that you will see used out there. And you'll want to be very careful about terminology. Uh, when people talk about threads, they might actually mean uh, the kind that we've talked about so far that is separately schedulable by the OS kernel, or they might mean this other variant, sometimes called a lightweight or green thread. This comes in a number of forms, and you'll see them in some kinds of threading libraries that are provided by certain program environments. I can think of one, there's a, a lightweight threading library in OCaml, and its default notion of a thread is a, a so-called green thread. Now, the meaning of this is that uh, it is entirely managed, uh, the running of this thing, within a single process. Uh, and so as you would run an OCaml program, for instance, and make use of this uh, green threads library or th sort of default threads library within OCaml, uh, what you will see is that you only ever get one sort of runnable entity. And that if you spin up four threads within this, uh, they're actually managed by the OCaml virtual machine instead. Uh, and since the operating system, uh, Linux in the case that you were running on such a system, doesn't know that there are separate entities that could be scheduled within there, uh, it only ever gives sort of the time allotted to a single process uh, to the overarching entity associated with this thing. Now this is done for a variety of reasons, like why would you make use of a green thread? Uh, primarily, this is not to get fast parallelism then, because you're never going to get more than one CPU allocated to this thing. From the OS perspective, there's one runnable entity. All it needs is one, uh, one processor uh, to run, uh, and so you'll never see it utilize more than 100% CPU as it works on stuff. But as we talked about earlier, there are other reasons to fire up multiple threads, uh, not just to parallelize attacks, uh, a, a task, but also instead to break that task into more manageable chunks where one thread is dealing with one uh, sort of facet of a problem and another thread is dealing with a separate distinct facet of it. A common spot that you'd see this is, for instance, in our latest project where you have one thread in a client that's dealing with a user typing messages that are to be sent to uh, the server and another thread that is dealing with receiving messages from a server. Uh, this divides very nicely and if you start up two threads, be they the sort of heavyweight schedulable threads or these lightweight green threads, uh, then you expect this isn't a computation that's CPU bound, it's more about communication, and it makes it more convenient if I can split that into two processes and just coordinate when they need to maybe put things on, strings, uh, on the screen. One minor advantage you get of these lightweight threads is they're essentially a bunch of malics that since there are no system calls involved with this, you tend to have uh, fast and light uh, creation of those threads, giving rise to the lightweight nomenclature associated with it. Historically, there may have been some implementations of pthreads that followed this track that they didn't actually interact with the operating system. But all of the pthreads implementations I've seen to date now in most modern Unix systems, they have this, uh, I hesitate to say heavyweight approach, but schedulable entity approach where the operating system kernel is definitely aware of them. All right. So to end then, we should probably discuss when you would want to use processes versus when you would use threads. That if the general advice is don't intermingle these, you have to, you should pick one of them, uh, then it'd be proper to just spend a moment to discuss and identify which are the signs that indicate I should use processes and which are the th signs that I should, should use threads. Uh, and so I'll ask folks pause for just a moment, deliberate on that, and then we'll end our discussion of this threads topic with uh, maybe, I think, some guidance on that front. 
should be long enough for folks to pause and think. Uh, we've alluded to this over and over, uh, but one final time, the notion of how much needs to be shared between these cooperating entities has a lot to indicate or is a great indication of whether processes or threads should be used. And generally, you want to use uh, this sharing business uh, to indicate if you have a, a lot of sharing that's required, threads are more of an obvious choice versus if you want more safety and isolation between the cooperating entities, processes which don't share much by default are a better choice on that front. Uh, to that end then, uh, you can also add to the mix uh, the following stuff. Uh, that the limited amount of sharing that processes have, where you explicitly state, here's my block of shared memory that I'm going to uh, sort of bring into the world via a memory map uh, or by a shared memory thing or explicit calls to things like uh, message queues and use of FIFOs and so forth. Uh, that sort of limits the amount of sharing that needs to happen uh, and creates very clear boundaries, which is usually a good thing. Cooperating entities, you don't want them to be too intertwined with each other and processes force you to think very carefully about what the interactions are actually going to be. The nice advantage you get in addition to that then is if these things are separate processes, they all have separate process IDs. That means they can be separately managed, killed, monitored using your standard set of OS tools like top and kill and so forth. Uh, this also then allows you uh, and sort of indication, you want to kill something, you send a signal directly to that entity. So there is less confusion about as I send a signal to this thing, who's actually going to handle that, who's going to be blocked to run the signal handle and so forth. It's going to be this process. They have their own disposition uh, and their own set of blocking semantics associated with signals there. So this is what I'd use sort of an indication of my application uh, is uh, sort of oriented towards this way, then I want to use processes. On the other hand, uh, if you have a case where you need to share a lot of data, that pretty much everything is uh, sort of should be globally shared out of the box, then threads are a uh, potentially a good uh, choice here. But I'd caution you strongly that if out of the box your thought is, oh, well, I'll just share everything because that'll make my life easier. This is not going to force you to think very carefully about how and when ta these entities that are cooperating need to coordinate on stuff until a later stage. And by then, you may have realized, oh crap, like this is too complex and I, I can't figure out all these different mutexes, who has locked what and why I'm getting deadlocked at this point. And at that point, you'll be forced to go back and rethink how do I control when these things are coordinating well. And uh, that's a discussion and a thought process should happen very early on when you're attempting to have some sort of a multi-threaded or multi-process uh, uh, sort of entity. I mean, the wisest decision in any of these cases is if you can avoid any sort of cooperation and single task this stuff, if that's on the table, then do it that way because it's much simpler. Uh, note then that as you would, um, uh, sort of uh, engage in using threads, you lose the OS ability to monitor these individual tasks at the sort of granularity that you might be accustomed to with processes. That top would show a single process using 400% of your CPU if it had four threads in it. Uh, and importantly, that means you can't kill one of those that is misbehaving uh, very easily. It's probably still possible, uh, but much harder with your standard top calls. And this is why uh, programs like Google Chrome, which want some separation and isolation between the tasks, the tabs associated with different websites, they have opted for, towards a process model, one process per tab. And that allows them to effectively utilize the underlying operating system to kill tabs that are misbehaving in some way. Uh, and if you absolutely need the fastest possible startup for subtasks, and what you plan to be doing is starting up threads uh, and shutting them down relatively quickly, uh, then this probably lends it towards uh, threads uh, because their startup overhead tends to be a little bit less uh, than your process. There's less copying involved. Um, that's on account of there's less sharing involved. So those broad sort of mechanisms then recommend uh, uh, where to go, uh, but generally your first choice for uh, doing anything is not to make it concurrent if possible. Only at the point that you would realize I need performance of one sort or another, or this concurrency of separate actors are really gonna make programming this easier. That's the point at which uh, you would make this choice. And you wanna consider that carefully. Uh, we've talked about this instance of, oh, here this part of the program is talking to the server, 
error. This is talking to the user. We've seen an instance in which you can do that using multiplexed IO calls like poll or the other one select uh, that allow you to uh, ask about multiple sources and then deal with them sequentially. And this tends to not actually hurt performance uh, too bad. Uh, and so the performance advantages that might be perceived with threads or even multiple processes, they come with a lot of pitfalls associated with them. So consider that carefully. Most performance sort of tasks involve the following that we've observed, that if you're trying to calculate pi, for instance, and want to spin up a bunch of cooperating threads, uh, then your general sort of workflow is here, do some setup, then launch four threads that are going to do exactly the same thing, close them down and merge the results. There are a number of special purpose extensions uh, to the C language and libraries that facilitate this kind of computation. Uh, one that is uh, widely deployed and even implemented in GC is something called OpenMP or Open Multiprogramming. It's usually built on top of uh, the threads that's thread bottom that's provided in pthreads, but it allows you to, for instance, say, here's this loop that's going to iterate uh, a billion times. I'd like to actually start up four threads that will subdivide that loop in some sensible way. And with a single line of code called a pragma, you can instruct the compiler to generate the startup, merging, and shutdown of four or eight threads that will multitask the iterations of that loop. Uh, this can make it much easier to introduce parallelism uh, for tasks where you don't have to actually explicitly deal with the threads, that you let the library take care of that. So uh, at the end of the day, then, if you find some compulsion to do concurrent programming, uh, for instance, in your project, be careful with it because it involves headaches. And if you really, really must, uh, uh, you can intermingle threads in IPC, but be prepared for a tough slog at that point. That's what I have for you in terms of threads. There's certainly much more that we could talk about both in theory and in practice, but I think some of the benefits that you'll get are just from implementing a threaded program that you'll see in the last project. Our next topic uh, will deal in a completely different area uh, with network programming through the notion of a Unix socket. Uh, we will pick up with this on Wednesday and it will carry us through to the last lecture of the semester next Monday. I hope everyone is healthy and happy hacking until we meet again.